name is Basil Moncrief. We're at the Graffiti House in Brandy Station, Virginia. This house is significant as a historic site because of all of the Civil War graffiti left by soldiers of each side inside the house, mostly upstairs in these three rooms that we're going to see. The uh, Brandy Station itself is the train station is right down there about 100 yards, and this was also the intersection of the old Carolina Road that went right into the railroad station. So this was an important strategic area. So it wasn't by accident that Lee's Army of Northern Virginia was encamped here. Stuart concentrated his 10,000 cavalry here to screen Lee's Army, and the Union Army wanted to get in here and see what was going on. So right now we are upstairs in the Marshall Room, so-called because of this signature right here, Captain James Marshall, Company E, 12th Virginia Cavalry. He was the grandnephew of Supreme Court Chief Justice John Marshall, longest serving Supreme Court Chief Justice in American history. He was one of three James Marshalls in this company, and uh, we used to think that he was the guy who was wounded here, but now we're not so sure. So there's more research going on. All of these signatures have been researched and continue to be researched. And unfortunately, most of the guys weren't nice enough to leave their full name in their unit. One of my favorites right here is Private Michael Bowman, Company H, 7th Virginia Cavalry. I like this guy because we have a picture of him. He survived the war. By the way, Captain James Marshall survived the war also. Uh, Private Bowman survived the war, although he was severely wounded. Um, let's take a look at this. Hope, Hose Company, New Jersey. Do you know what a hose company is? Fire? Firefighting Brigade. So these guys joined the Union Army as a band. They were the, they were firefighters who had a band. They joined the Union Army as a band. At this, we know they were here during the encampment of the winter of 1863, 1864, because they were the band for the Second Corps. So they left their mark. Um, so then there's some guys that weren't so nice about leaving their unit. Frank E. Kelly had great penmanship, did a lot of research on this, found two possible authors of the signature, Frank E. Kelly of the Second Virginia Cavalry and Frank E. Kelly of the 3rd Massachusetts Artillery. We don't know which one it was. Um, we see here some horse graffiti. Before all the extensive renovation of uh, the rooms where they, it's a very technical, painstaking process to peel back all these layers of paneling, wallpaper, paint, and whitewash. And before all of that started, we were saying, what, how, there's no, we can't find any pictures of horses. Well, now we've got seven pictures of horses since we've revealed all of the, uh, all of the graffiti underneath. Looks like I, looks like I drew this one. This one here looks kind of like a brontosaurus. And then this one over here is a little bit better. But Confederate cavalrymen had to provide their own horses. Union cavalry, the government issued them a horse. So we kind of wonder if Confederate cavalrymen, maybe a lot of these were drawn by the Confederates because they're more attached to their animals. Up here we have Big Bob Lewis. Big Bob Lewis was with the uh, Portsmouth Battery of the Norfolk Artillery. We know a little bit about Big Bob Lewis because he was in the Invalid Regiment for most of the war. You're probably aware a lot more soldiers died from disease than died from battle wounds. Uh, the biggest killer on both sides was dysentery, chronic diarrhea, and uh, would wonder if Big Bob Lewis was debilitated by that, but he was in and out of his unit, mostly in uh, the invalid regiments throughout the uh, war. So now we're, we've left the Marshall Room, now we're in the Bowman Room. It's named for this fellow right here, Sergeant Allen Bowman, not related to the Bowman next door of Company E, 12th Virginia Cavalry. So when this room was first being restored, the uh, coverings were cut down to about here, and the Fredericksburg newspaper came and did, a, and did a story on it. The story went on the wire service, and uh, people down in South Carolina said, Sergeant Allen Bowman, 12th Virginia Cavalry, that's our great-great-great-grandpa, 
And so they came up here and now they've had uh, several family reunions here. More importantly, you've uh, probably heard from the book of Micah, when peace comes, uh, we hammer our swords into plowshares. Well, Sergeant Bowman, our same Sergeant Bowman on that wall, had his bayonet hammered into a garden hoe. And his family was kind enough to loan this to us to put on display. And there's Sergeant Bowman in later life. He was actually from Fauquier County, uh, the adjacent county here. So over here, here's another one. Uh, we know this is a nurse uh, by her uniform. Um, there were several volunteer nurses that were here in the encampment, uh, the Union encampment. And we also know there were Confederate nurses that would be, you know, assist soldiers, wounded soldiers during the, uh, during the battles. Over here, one of our actual piece of uh, real art here, we call her the Dancing Lady. She's not actually dancing. If you look closely, she's pulling up the hems of her dress and she's walking on planks. Looks like she's walking on planks across a mud hole. You can imagine this area in the winter encampment, 130,000 Union soldiers turned into a sea of mud the first time it snowed or rained. And so we think maybe she was going someplace, visiting the encampment and walking across like a board uh, sidewalk. But what's interesting about this is the caption where the artist or somebody else said, turned over to Lieutenant Gale. So this is Lieutenant Gale. Our, he's from Vermont. And our research has shown us that he was here at the encampment. He was also working with possibly in this building as a provost marshal officer, which was kind of the police force for the camp. So when a visitor, and visitors were common, especially in the Union camps, mothers, fathers, wives would come to visit and they would have to process through the provost marshal's office so and we know from our research that lieutenant gale's wife visited him here during early uh, november 1863 robert e lee was encamped here this is after gettysburg and it's before grant's overland campaign they're encamped here and here comes the union army robert e lee sees them coming and says i think i'm going to move my camp someplace else so lee moves his camp of the Army of Northern Virginia, about 60,000 strong at that time, down to Orange County. And the Union Army moves in here on November 8th. And we see this graffiti, first snow, November 9th, 1863. Now, our researchers had to look that up, of course. And sure enough, the first snow of 1863 was November 9th. So that's, you know, that's the kind of thing that makes us feel good that you know, we're, we're finding stuff that we know is historically accurate, not just, not just some guy writing whatever comes into his head, you know. Um, how about over here? This man is uh, fairly well dressed. We sometimes call him W.C. Fields, the old comedian. And then he's looking at the rump of this horse. And then there's a caption up here that says, he smells a rebel. So we're thinking this is Maybe this horse was drawn by a Confederate soldier, and this guy was drawn by a Union soldier who put the caption in here, poking at the rebels. You know, he's looking at the horse's rump and saying, I smell a rebel. We also think that this fragment of graffiti alludes to Lee uh, pulling up stakes and leaving here in November 1863. We think what it says is inglorious skedaddle of rebels talking about lee uh um, moving his camp as the union army came into culpeper county thanks for watching and don't miss a single episode as we delve into the fascinating history of maine's role in the civil war please like and subscribe now